board games are a lot like bees. Are they, Matthew? <laughs> they generate a lot of buzz. You've got to approach them carefully. And some of them are really cute and others will sting you. Yeah, that totally works. Board games are just like bees. Hi, I'm Matthew Jew from This Game's Broken and Chaz has invited me here today to talk to you about 10 games that recently generated some buzz. These are our top 10 underdog games we're rooting for this month. At number 10 is D100 Dungeon, self-published in 2017. D100 Dungeon takes a single player out on an adventure with just a pencil, a few sheets of paper, two D10s, a D6, a rule book, a character sheet that they've created, their imagination, probably a table to sit at. I mean, who doesn't have the mobile phone on them? Clothes, that is up to the player. This dungeon delving game aches of classic RPG adventures combined with the choose your own adventure book. The player's character or quest through the dungeon and succeed or fail their story will develop with better loot, better equipment and gold. Precious, precious gold. Players can record their progress as they go a questing so they can easily return back to the dungeon whenever they want, making it the perfect way to fight some game group withdrawal. Hinged at number 9 is At the Gates of Liang, published in 2009 by Taste of Mineral Games, which caught a lot of people's attention earlier this month, we think because it went on sale from a major online retailer. But it's just a great excuse to talk about it because I love Liang. It's fantastic. My box, it's all beaten up. But I've got all this little tray in there. It's got all these little pieces, all these wooden stuff. A coin. Where did that coin come from? Who knows? All the car. Oh, I love the little. None of this is important. I'm just realizing. Liang is a market game where you produce goods. The fields, customers, helpers, and shops are represented by cards, which are distributed each round by a mechanism in which players end up with one card they draw and another card drafted from a public offering. Other players will get angry. Everyone gets angry. I love this game so much. After planning, harvesting, and the distribution of cards, players can then take as many actions as the clever manipulation of their resources will allow them to earn most money. And money lets you buy points, and early money is worth more than late money. And it's all a terrible reminder of the irrevocable reality of currency devaluation. The fact that the systematic economic depreciation is a built-in inevitability of our system, and also something to do with aliens coming here to harvest gold, I don't know. The other case of Liang has it all. It doesn't have any of that last bit, actually. So bear that in mind. And number eight is that underdog, most likely not to be an underdog, or Umlantenbau, which is an acronym that does not work at all. But this book-based release from Renegade Games is 2017's Ex Libris. In Ex Libris, each player is a collector of rare and valuable books in a thriving gnomish village. Rare books are apparently a big deal with gnomes, like Blood to Vampires or Skin Care to Frankenstyle Abominations. Recently, the mayor of this gnomish village, which while being a self-contained district without a truly centralised government structure, does still demonstrate some basic corporate powers, making it more of a township, if anything, if I'm being honest with you. Anyway, the mayor announced an opening for a grand librarian, a prestigious and lucrative position which will be awarded by the most qualified villager slash township inhabitant. And so, to outshine their competition, players will need to expand their personal library by sending trusty assistants out into the village that I will say still needs to be officially ratified in order for provincial reform <laughs> to find the most impressive tomes. What's more is that players only have a single week before the mayor's official inspector comes to judge their libraries. So they'll need shrewd planning, cunning tactics, and perhaps a little magic, obviously, to surpass their opponents and become the Grand Librarian. It's a dangerous and possibly evil inevitability that eventually every game will have a junior edition. And other than a lie, that is absolutely the case with 2020's Andor Junior, the next game in the Legends of Andor line, in which players work together to fill quests, solve puzzle-filled adventures, and most probably face bitter defeat, because a lot of this game scenarios are crazy difficult. Andor Junior is designed for players 7 and up, and lands at number 7 on our list. Gamers slip into the roles of warriors, mages, dwarves and rangers to travel across the land in a quest to save some lost wolf pops. Players win the game only if they work hand in hand and make wise decisions. Each game of Andor Junior offers challenges which must be mastered as a team 
in time before a dreadful dragon reaches the city of Wrightburg and just destroys everything. I mean, just utter devastation. No survivors. <laughs> the monstrosities I imagine gave me nightmares and I'm at best an emotional husk. Though also it has Michael Menzel artwork, so it does look lovely. If you want to start your own adventure as early, Andor Junior seems like it might be a really great way to go. The next game on our list recently underwent a name change, which actually isn't all that uncommon in the world of tabletop gaming. Vindication was originally named Epoch the Awakening, Gugong was originally Forbidden City, Terror and Meeple City was originally Rampage, and Andor Junior was originally titled The Night of Dragon Devoured My Family. And number six is Amul, which was originally announced as Silk Road, a card game of bustling bazaars for up to eight aspiring merchants. In Amul, each player is a striving business person, competing for wealth and success. How do they do that, you ask? By drafting cards, of course. How else? You'll be drafting cards from a market to collect goods and valuables, hiring guards, assembling caravans, and establishing contracts with traders, all while you manage your hand effectively as only certain cards can be played to the table for scoring while others must remain present in your hand for optimal game scoring. Exciting. And it's devious twists like this that make games a lot of fun. And infuriating, but fun. But I just needed one more turn, but it was fun until I lost. I'm so angry, but man, wasn't that fun. And while the city of Amul was one of the largest centres of international trade in ancient times, today we have the internet which provides merchants with countless commerce opportunities by embedding curiously curated commercials continually into common countdowns. Yes, this is an ad break. Welcome back, and let's pretend the fifth game on our list this month is Empire of the Stars from Crosscut Games. Mainly because it is, but make-believe does make the world better. Empire of the Stars takes place, you know, shortly after the last galactic emperor has had a sudden and quite fatal encounter with a merciless space dragon that burnt down their space village, which is again, slightly made up. But what's not made up is the not so small power vacuum in the galaxy which players will try to fill through empire building, exploration, conflict and a struggle for dominance. Based on the award winning game Galactic Emperor, this completely new experience gives 2-4 to four players each one of 30 asymmetric powers and control of their own throne in their own lizard infested sector of the galaxy. Using a unique action selection system, the game plays over several rounds, during which the actions available are determined by the roles players select, such as explorer, merchant, steward, engineer, scientist, warlord, and regent. Now, of course, if one of those roles was just galactic emperor, then the game would be a lot shorter then, wouldn't it? The player who best explores new worlds, expands their empire, exploits their precious resources and income, and exterminates their opponents will score the most galaxy tokens and win the game. I always call them space books, even in Trajan. Space books. At number four is Vampire the Masquerade, Vendetta, in which players scheme and fight for influence and power as immortal vampires. Can we all just kill along? No, no, the answer is no. Players play cards and bleed blood to earn the control of influential humans, feed on them and turn them into servants. It's also a centuries long blood sucking hellscape. Oh, it's like the DMV. It's like being at the DMV. Players draft cards at the beginning of the game, then gradually draw an increasing number of cards from their deck at the beginning of each age. The goal within the game is to gain the most influence over the course of three ages. While playing, players get to know the powers and abilities of their opponents, but they can never know which new tricks their rivals added to their arsenal since their last encounter. Perhaps some sort of garlic flavoured all over body spray named Clove. Chaz wrote that bit, and honestly, he disappoints me, but I'm betting the graphic was pretty impressive. You know, if I'd been born a few hundred years ago in the newly founded United States, owned a horse, knew how to 
ride a horse and had an unquenchable thirst for adventure, discovery, and being bitten by animals of increasing lethality, then I would lead my wagon train along the perilous Oregon Trail. Which completely, coincidentally, is something that players can do in the 2017 game by Taste of Minstrel Games, Pioneer Days. This is a dice drafting game reminiscent of the Oregon Trail. While players pursue their strategies, they must be prepared for impending disasters such as storms, disease, raids, famine, and just a concert of spontaneous joy and death. At the end of each round, players can win the favour of towns they visit, which will provide them resources and encouragement they need to continue on to the next disease-ridden storm of danger they will encounter. The player who best makes proper preparations for the disasters laying in wait while they pursue their strategy will earn the most points and win the game. At number two is a classic underdog, Sinners, a game self-published in 2019 which casts players as preachers who have made a deal with the devil to live 100 more years. There's no way that will completely backfire on you. There's no way you forget to ask for, you know, like off the top of my head, like an allowance. But you know, enough about my problems. To fulfill their end of the deal, the players must collect 100 years worth of souls of other sinners. To accomplish this objective, players must lure sinners into their churches in order to repent, where they will perform sacraments and harvest their soul through means totally don't include murder. Sinners won second place in the best gateway game category in 2019's two-player print and play game design contest, which is also pretty cool, but part of my contract for my soul requires me to mention some of the other videos we have posted on this channel, which is terrifyingly vague. But first, this month's top game. And topping our list this month is the next upcoming title from Elf Creek Games, Merchants of the Dark Road, which launches its Kickstarter campaign on June 2nd. In this game, after half a year of daylight, players must now prepare for the dark season. During the dark season, the roads will be treacherous, but they will still need to be braved by a select few in order to keep the cities thriving. And that's where you come in. In Merchants of the Dark Road, players are brave merchants that travel the dangerous paths between cities. Most of the actions will take place using a rondel action system, which will allow players to collect and produce items, sell them, hire local heroes, manipulate the market price of items, visit the back alley cellars and delve into a nearby dungeon, or they'll encounter ghastly ghouls and possibly a guy named Wendell. Look, Wendell is ace. I love him. There's a song about when you I'll sing it. Oh Wendell, your face is full of flies. Oh. I sung it when they found what was left of his body. Plays must deliver goods and heroes to the best destinations. Balancing money and fame are key to winning because a final score will reflect the lower of those two values. After all, what good is a purse full of coin if the people don't sing songs about the players? And what good is a song with an empty mug of veil? It depends. Does that player still have their soul intact? Because that seems like it could possibly balance it out to me. But that's just the opinion of one man. A man with a fully functioning soul and terrible negotiation practices. I've made so many mistakes. Anything. I could have asked for anything. And there's the list of games we're rooting for this month. Thanks for watching. And here are some of the other videos you might enjoy more or less or equal to your subjective level of enjoyment of this video. Either way, I've been Matthew Jew from This Game's Broken in association with Paradise Paradise. Take care.